Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about protection, protection of human rights and civil rights of the diverse Asian American and Pacific Islander communities with our special guests, Arthi Coley, uh, Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice and the Asian Law Caucus. So Arthi, thank you so much for joining us. This topic could not be more timely. We've all been reading about the various attacks, um, some of them just really uh, heinous, um, directed against uh, elderly um, you know, Asian men and women walking on the street, um, basically sucker punches and, and, and just really terrible, terrible behavior. And also sometimes the, the witnesses um, are exhibiting um, just a callous disregard of, of their fellow Americans. Could you talk a little bit about your organization, its origins, and, and let's talk about this, this issue, which is not new to the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me here, Mark. Um, yeah, my organization is Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. We're the first pan-Asian civil rights organization in the country. And we were formed in the 19, in 1972. Um, and by the children and, and grandchildren of folks who were interned uh, under Japanese internment. And, um, and so, you know, we do have a long history of anti-Asian discrimination in this country and going back hundreds of years. To, um, you know, if you go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and and uh, Asian Americans were, were referred to as the yellow peril. And that was actually, you know, um, we were seen as a public health threat at that time. Um, and South Asians were referred to as the dusky peril. Um, there was even a riot in Bellingham, Washington, where all the South Asian workers were literally, you know, um, railroaded out of town. Um, so, you know, that led to that interpersonal hate and discrimination, you know, led to policies in this country that basically prevented our immigration for 50 years. Um, and it prevented us from becoming full citizens. Um, you know, you had the alien land laws in California aimed at Japanese Americans, so they could not own land to farm. Um, and when you fast forward, um, to internment during World War II, where Japanese Americans were, you know, their loyalty was questioned. They were seen as national security threat only because of their national origin. There was no other, you know, evidence of, of disloyalty. Um, you know, this narrative of us as perpetual foreigners continued. Um, and then you fast forward to the 80s when we had the um, decline in our auto industry. You had in, 19, um, in the 1980s, the killing, the brutal murder of Vincent Chin, who was um, you know, killed by two auto workers who thought he was Japanese American. As it turned out, he was Chinese American, but they beat him to death. And um, you know, that was a moment in time where the Asian American community really galvanized. Um, and you see at that moment, some of the nonprofits or um, that are around now, you know, came into being in terms of, you know, advocacy on behalf of Asian Americans. And part of, part yeah, of, go ahead. Part, <laughs> the issue, part of the issue that we have is an American issue. And part of the issue is just a human issue. Um, if you look at the founding of this country, um, uh, so much uh, is, um, is connected with identity. Um, and race and religion. Um, the yearning to be free uh, was also a yearning for um, identity, which had its dark side, um, which um, uh, meant uh, identity was white and European. Um, and then you take a look at, at us as people, us, all of us, and each of us carries some burden Right? And if you, if you take a look at the diverse Asian communities, there are inter-community uh, uh, tensions because Asian community is not one thing, right? You have the tensions between 
uh, people of Japanese uh, extraction and Korean extraction and Chinese extraction and all those complexities, Philippine ex extraction. Um, how do we deal with the idea of race and identity in the United States such that we are one people, Americans, uh, regardless as to the tone of our skin um, or our, our national origin? How do we actually uh, overcome our own individual um, uh, uh, inclinations to see somebody and have a thought based on their appearance? Yeah, that's a big question. I think it's a, it's a question we're facing as a society, a society that at, at its origin is rooted in white supremacy, right? You know, um, that was the justification for um, you know, taking the land away from ind indigenous people. That was the justification for slavery, right? And so when it's in our, in our origin, it's, it's uh, something that we have to really work hard to get rid of. And we have to acknowledge that while there is interpersonal and, and implicit bias that we all carry, we are part of systems that are set up under white supremacy. Right, the police came into being in the beginning because they were catching runaway slaves, you know. And so you can't you can't get away from the origins of some of our systems. So I think we have to attack it both systemically, and then I think there are things that we have to do to teach people um, each other's histories. So you know, we support um, you know ethnic studies curricula for K through twelve kids, because if we don't understand, if kids don't understand each other's history, how are they supposed to, you know, um, accept each other? And so these are important things that we have to do systemically in our society. And I think one of the interesting things I'm noticing is that people are much more willing to talk about race. There was a time when it was taboo. And, and I think we have to acknowledge um, the racial hierarchy and inequities before we can actually even tackle them. I don't. I, I, I don't. I'm not sure that I buy the the um, what you're saying completely. Okay. I think that, that we have too many uh, narratives that uh, seem to be in opposition to each other, and they really ought to be more inclusive. So, for example, the idea that police were founded um, uh, uh, in order to catch runaway slaves is true. But it's also not the entire story. Police were also founded to, uh, to protect property. Mm -hmm. um, were also founded to investigate uh, inner city cr uh, cr crime and, and keep the peace in urban populations. There were a number of different stories that can be told about the founding of, of police. Police were also founded in order to protect the railways um, at, from their own workers who were very mm -hmm. often- uh, Striking. <laughs> You know, striking and, and yeah. workers, right? So right. there are a lot of different stories. Um, Absolutely, there is not just just sort of one truth. And the same thing with with racism, right? There is a strain of white supremacism in, in the United States, but there are also um, strains of supremacism uh, or or um, this this idea of of uh, superiority based in race mm -hmm. uh, that. Um, are effect, infecting uh, human beings across the board. Oh, How do we yeah. end up dealing with the issue today of anti-Asian violence that seems to be coming from economic interests, tensions, um, uh, a, an attempt for political gain. How do we end up converting people into an idea that allows them to embrace Americans that, that look differently from themselves. That, that me as a white person can see an Asian person walking down the street and think that is a fellow citizen. How do we deal with that? Um, can we legislate it? Um, do we do it through our educational system? How do we, how do I we- I mean, you can't legislate acceptance. I mean, I think narrative and culture change is what is the one of the keys, right? When you think about the LGBTQ movement, right, in, in their trajectory of, of being vilified, and now, you know, there is, I think, 
across the board a lot of acceptance and embracing of LGBTQ folks. And I, you see that part of what needed to happen is people needed to acknowledge that these were our neighbors, these were our children, these were our friends, and these were folks who were human beings, right? They were not the other. So, you know, you can have a, a, a framing that the, these people are the other, which is what you had politicians doing last year. And, and actually for many in the past few years, you know, uh, one of the challenges for uh, immigrants and immigrant, even second or third generation is that, you know, you're, you're constantly identified with your country of origin, right? right? And you're not seen as American. And so if we have a foreign policy issue with another country, that comes back to bite communities here. And so that's a really hard challenge. Um, and part of what needs to happen is people need to know we are, you know, we are human beings who are here, have a long history of being here. And um, this idea of what is America is also needs to change, right? Um, for some people, they feel a lot of threat, right? That America is shifting. We're shifting into a majority minority country. I think that's hard for folks who are used to being, you know, thinking of America as, as a country of mainly, you know, white people. And so um, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of narrative inclusion. Um, and that, that can't be legislated. Right. But there is a piece that is also uh, about legisl legislation. Yes, right? absolutely. And we're doing that work. Uh, so, so let's talk about the, the legal work that you do um, in order to first protect, because if people can't be protected, people can't walk on the street uh, in freedom. Um, there is no freedom. Right. So, so talk a little bit about the work that you do on a day to day basis to push back uh, racism, anti-Asian racism in this country? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of legal work um, in, in a range of issues like, you know, whether it's pro protecting low-income tenants from eviction, workers' rights, getting Asian workers who don't speak English access to benefits. And, and that work has been, you know, ongoing for, for a long time. We, we uh, protect uh, Asian Americans from deportation, all that work. And then now, you know, we've really had to look for solutions for safety because a lot of, I mean, if you talk to folks on the ground, they won't actually disclose um, the, the hate that's coming at them. They don't feel comfortable going to the police. There's a real and, reluctance, right? I mean, that yeah. comes from, a, from histories, not only that their families might have suffered before they came to the United States, but after coming to the United States, very often anti-Asian hatred and violence has just been ignored by law enforcement. Yeah, and then, you know, some people, you know, we have a growing undocumented Asian community in this country. There's over a million undocumented Asians. And so if your immigration status, you know, is at risk, you're, you're concerned about going to the police. Um, and so there are all these factors, language being a big one, you know, um, and so one of the programs that we're looking at promoting and seeing if we can get more support for our community ambassador programs. So this idea being that you have folks in the community who are culturally competent, who aren't showing up in, you know, with, with big law enforcement kind of, you know, uniforms, but they're there um, to uh, walk with you and, and be visible to you if you need help. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the programs that we feel like could be useful for our community. Um, we're also, one of the other challenges is, um, you know, the vast majority of incidents, fortunately, but, you know, tragically don't actually rise to the level of crime. So what happens is people do call the police and the police say, well, we can't do anything. Right. And, and so, but that doesn't leave, I mean, that leaves the victim still feeling traumatized. No one has recognized the harm that has come at them when somebody spat at them or, you know, harassed them. And so what kind of um, programs can we offer for these people to go to, um, you know, to get support? You know, are there mental health support services? Are there 
I mean, people get scared. They don't want to leave their home. You know, are there other um, in some victims, you know, if, even if you're the victim of a crime, if you don't file a police report, let's say the perpetrator flees and you have no idea who this person is, you can't access a victim's compensation fund, even if you end up in the hospital. And so we've got to make these, um, you know, these services and systems that are in place available. And then we've got to experiment with new programs. Um, that are actually going to meet the needs of our communities. We just completed a, uh, a poll where we asked, do you believe that recent uh, violence targeted Asian Americans was encouraged by racist or anti-Asian rhetoric? And 95% of the people responding, responded uh, answered in the affirmative. Do you believe that, that um, our leaders given, given license um, by characterizing um, this disease as having an ethnic origin um, and um, and uh, some of the anti-Chinese uh, rhetoric, just as the rhetoric. Absolutely. Uh, is, do you believe that that actually has resulted? Is there is there a cause and effect relationship between that and and the attacks that have happened on the streets recently? Yeah, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, I'm I'm South Asian, so I saw what happened post 9/11. Anybody who was perceived to be Muslim, you know, you have Sikhs and other folks and, and Muslims were harmed and, and, you know, killed, even shot at gas stations. And, and so, you know, actually, I started an Asian American leaders table to address COVID-19 racism a year ago, to gather leaders from across the country to, to address this, because I could see it coming. Right. And, and one of, you know, we did scenario planning. And one of the scenarios we planned for was a shooting. I mean, and, and I was just really, you know, heartbroken when the shooting happened in Atlanta. Um, and I just, you know, the his, history has taught us what happens to groups um, when they are being targeted, you know, by political leaders and, you know, calling it the Kung flu, the Wuhan virus, all of that stuff had a real impact on communities here. Yeah, so when we talk about uh, countering these issues, you mentioned uh, some of the legal work that you've done. You mentioned advocacy. You mentioned sort of bridge building between people who might have a distrust of, of authority uh, based in their own experience and their own history and the authorities themselves. What kind of a responsibility do members of the community uh, themselves, because um, various Asian communities um, have a reputation of being uh, sort of this sort of uh, model minority. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or keeping quiet, keeping your head down, uh, and so on. What? How important is it to speak up, whether it's in entertainment, comedy, uh, speaking out as as political advocates, speaking out in legislatures, private sector, corporation. Yeah. How, how important is that? It's incredibly important. And we are doing bystander intervention trainings um, for a lot of um, partners. Um, and those are trainings about how, if, how to safely and comfortably intervene. And there are different levels of interventions that individuals can engage in. Um, and um, it's also trainings for if something happens to you. Um, and so um, we found that there is interest in, in a lot of uh, different sectors for those trainings. Um, I think Asian Americans need to hear from, from their neighbors, their, their employers, um, their communities that they are welcome and people care for them. Um, you know, there's no bigger trauma than having first being harmed I, I, you know, we have a hate tracker and so we get these reports and, you know, actually the hate was when uh, started in 2016, the, when, when you saw the anti-China rhetoric being ramped up, you, the hate, you know, also started. It really got worse under COVID, but even before then, you know, there was a report um, in, in the, I'm in the Bay Area, which is kind of seen as a liberal bastion, right? <laughs> you would think, oh, there's a lot of, you know, inclusion here, but there's a report of a woman in a coffee shop where, you know, she was, you know, somebody was attacking her verbally and telling her to go back to her country. And she was surrounded by people who said nothing, nothing. And, you know, she was shocked. 
like first at the hate that came at her and then the fact that nobody stood up for her. Right, right. It's, yeah. Well, and, and that's that's a matter of voice, right? We, none of us are bystanders. We're all involved. And so acting as if uh, there, there's any way to duck responsibility, um, either by not speaking up or uh, by uh, allowing these, these incidents to, to go past, um, we bear responsibility for that. There was a question that was just uh, completed on, an, on another poll. Has racism against Asian Americans been used for political advantage among certain voters? And 73% of the respondents said yes. Now let's say that's true. It really does beg the question of who the, who the voters are who will vote based on racist tropes, right? Who are those people who will allow their voices either to be silenced or who will feel that they have a uh, license now because they've been given permission to, uh, to be racist and therefore will vote for that person. Who are we as Americans? Um, how do you counter that acceptability of racism in the United States? How do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a range of um, of practices that we need to engage in to deal with the racism. And even one thing is to counter it by actually giving voting rights and, and power to people who don't feel that way. And so one of the things that we've engaged in for a long time as a community is, is nonpartisan get out the vote, um, work with Asian American communities. And we did it nationally, um, if, for example, in Georgia, you know, we we really activated the Asian American vote there um, in this past election in partnership with our uh, with our folks at, at Advancing Justice Atlanta, and um, you see that giving Asian Americans an outlet and the uh, power to you know exercise their their civic rights is is a way to counter you know the 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 racist uh voting and um you know one of the things i'm really concerned about are these laws that the voter suppression laws that are coming out now in for example in georgia and we're looking at you know legal challenges to those laws so it's it's really a matter of of learning uh, activism learning how to um to assert as americans uh one's voice you know our our, our landlord uh, here in San Francisco is a veteran of World War II and Korea, uh, mm -hmm. long, long serving uh, military um, man. And uh, uh, I was talking with his daughter the other day and she was saying, you know, when I was um, younger, I was, I was very active. Um, and then we, we talked about our kids mm -hmm. um, and how that activism seems to have dissipated with prosperity. Um, mm -hmm. and with a, sen a sense of complacence, a sense of acceptance, particularly in urban areas, um, she was basically opining that we really do need to start thinking about our role as citizens and our duty as citizens to be civically engaged in shaping America. Um, and, and if we cede that, that territory, that that territory ends up getting taken by people um, who, have, who have other views, um, what is your view of, of how we ought to uh, involve ourselves as Americans in the civil society of the country? Can we just prosper and, and just leave that to, to other people who are more professionally engaged, or is that the responsibility of us all? No, absolutely. We can't do it alone. I, as someone who's professionally engaged in protecting our democracy, I can tell you that um, it, we need all of us. Uh, involved in this effort. And you can see, you know, from uh, just even this past year, how um, our, our democracy can be very fragile. You know, we've got to work hard to um, make sure that we reinforce these structures that we've built over many years. And so uh, absolutely, I think, you know, um, there is a role for government we can't, you know, we've got to protect that. We've got to, we've got to demand both accountability from the government and also protect it. And so it's, it's this interesting balance that we're always striking as, as um, advocates. 
And I, what I see now is, which is very heartening, is an incredible amount of activism coming out of the youth. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, there is, I think they have less sort of preconceived notions and they are very, um, uh, you know, already embracing sort of intersectional analyses. Like, you know, they, they, the youths, I think, are very comfortable with uh, working across different uh, racial groups and other identities. And, um, and I think there's a lot of hope there of directing that energy towards social change. We just took another poll and we asked, do you believe that Asian Americans are sufficiently organized to effectively counter racism against Asians in the United States? And 71% said no. Uh, I agree. How how do we, so youth are more accustomed to working across uh, different divisions, but it's very difficult um, in the Asian community if if you consider um, Chinese ethnic groups, right, from uh, 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 different parts of China in the United States, uh, Japanese, Korean, well, right? yeah, Vietnamese, so this, right? yeah, no, Hello, absolutely, yeah, you know, no, South Asian, right? How yeah, do you know right, uh, yeah. Well, because Asian is a political identity. It's a political identity. It's not a language group. It's not a country that people come from, right? right. It's a political identity, and we actually. You know, the case that's being made to our communities, and I think they understand this, is we have more power together, right? And that we do have certain cultural things in common. And we have a certain, you know, we have the policies in this country that were aimed at our communities in common. And so we actually have to build power together. And and one of the reasons we don't, we aren't as organized as we need to be is we haven't been invested in. We've been historically small groups. We're the fastest growing minority in this country. We'll be 10% of the population by 2050. That's huge. And so now is the time to invest in our communities. Now is the time to do the hard work of bringing us together. And that's part of what we're trying to do. So part of this is becoming more sophisticated about the compromises that we need to make in order to become politically more potent, right? It's, it's, it's understanding that we might have differences, but the commonality of interests really should trump that. And, and making those compromises so that joint action can be taken on the most important issues is, is, is really important. It all starts with talking to each other, doesn't it? Absolutely. So um, I'm gonna let you uh, sort of see us out. What is your hope for the United States going into the future. We have right now a real issue with uh, consciousness of racism in this country, but also the tendency to uh, divide and subdivide in a way that dilutes power for progressive change, right? Progressive change basically meaning progress, right? I'm not talking about a political movement, I'm talking about uh, progress. Right. So how do we move forward? What are your hopes for the next five years in terms of how the dialogue shifts in the United States and what can each of us do to be part of that progress in, in America? Yeah, my hope is that we all take this on as a personal challenge to learn and grow about, about each other and to think about how we, what kind of future do we want for our children? You know, what kind of society are we building here? Is it one of inclusion? Is it one of, you know, of uh, health and safety where we have clean air and clean water and where we have, you know, people feel protected um, and safe? And, you know, what are we going to do to break down the inequities? Because we have a challenge in our country. We're, we're, We're deep inequities. We're the biggest wealth gap just in the Asian American community alone. And so we have a responsibility to each other to, to make these changes. And we, I'm, it's not just an individual responsibility. We need to challenge our civic and political leaders. We need to challenge philanthropy and we need to challenge the private sector and corporations. We all have a role to play in uh, addressing these inequities. It's such an important point. What you're saying is, is that all of us have a responsibility to think about 
what America is going to be about. What is America going to be about when it comes to wealth and wealth distribution of opportunity and opportunity distribution of race? You know, how do we see ourselves as, as having a common history and a common set of values of rights, of freedom of speech, right? Every American ought to be talking to every other American about the future of the country and we ought to become active in it. And part of this change is that white Americans should be thinking about Asian Americans and Asian Americans should be thinking about Latin Hispanic Americans, Latin, Hispanic, uh, uh, Latin and Hispanic Americans should be thinking about African Americans, right? How do you change ourselves to be the America we wanna be? Yeah, I mean, we actually have to work in partnership and in allyship with each other. And we have to, I mean, the, one of the basic things I've learned as a leader is one of the best things you can do is listen. So you have to step back and give people an opportunity to tell you their story and really deeply listen. And I think it starts there. And deal with people's concerns, people who don't necessarily agree with you. I mean, that's yeah. part of it. Arthi Coley, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing the work that you do as Executive Director of the Asian Americans Advancing Justice and the Asian Law Caucus. Thank you all um, attendees for your questions and for your contributions. Everybody stay safe. Mask up. <laughs>